Honestly, I didn't know about the, how different to find out on the subculture. So what is uh, you know, the borderline? My reality is this borderline is almost melting. Murakami loves to confound expectations. I think he loves especially to play with the preciousness of the contemporary art world. I am not thinking about this is a risk because this is um, uh, my advantage. That's why I can make many collaboration, like with uh, you know Kanye West. Murakami really was introduced to the kind of giants of Western contemporary art in the late 1980s. I was learning the Western contemporary art system, and I came to New York. I am very difficult to find out my standing position in, in New York art world. So just, you know, I'm using for the, you know, Orientalism, about using for the manga image. I'm not satisfied this situation. That's why, you know, I, across the borderline, this is also, you know, I can make uh, my identity, the Japanese artist identity. And what is the main theme right now, the contemporary art scene is, one thing is uh, how breakthrough the old school, and one thing is uh, how battle with, uh, you know, capitalism. So because, you know, Jeff Koons and Damien Hurst doing the, this battle, that's why I follow that. Around 2007, 2008, Murakami was really enjoying a lot of success. Before the, you know, big earthquake, looks like I completely forget I came from Japan. All of that really kind of created a bit of a turning point for him in a way, and almost maybe even a crisis of, of creativity. I woke up when I see the, you know, the Japanese, the earthquake, you know, reality. And then you see him introduce these figures called Arhats, which are Buddhist monk figures that would have walked around the countryside, bringing healing and things to people. Originally, you know, Ar Arhat is 16. 16 Arhat is very important because this 16 people is the student of Buddha. So Japanese people using Buddha this, you know, story. Okay, if we can create, you know, many number of the Arahat, take care about each some ill or some problem. So that's why, you know, Japanese people created for another for over 400. So he started making these paintings of arhats and collections of arhats. There's a painting of 69 arhats and a painting of 100 arhats. And then there's also a 300 foot long painting called the 500 arhats, which really kicked it all off. You know, 500 arhat painting is huge and uh, very short time to making everything. I employ for uh, like over 100 people. Looks like, you know, movie production. I'm the geek for the Japanese animation stuff, and also the American sci-fi stuff. For example, Star Wars, the first sequence is uh, completely 3D, right? So, but the uh, Japanese sci-fi stuff is, you know, kind of that moving, completely, you know, different. So, the main visual philosophy came from the very naturally to making a flatness. So, but at the same time to having uh, some dimension. Super flat is a term that Murakami himself coined. Uh, this theory came from the Edo period painter, Jakucho Ito. He made a chicken painting. He made a dog's painting. So that is completely flatness composition. A uh, lot of chickens, a lot of dogs. The painter is organizing for the eyeball moving. But he also sees this theory much more broadly, and for him it really talks a lot about a Japanese culture where um, there's no th real distinction between high art and low art. So it's a way of kind of leveling all of those distinctions that we really get caught up on in the West and sort of flattens them out. For example, 
Who is the highest level in Japanese culture scene? Is a comic writer is the highest. When I created Mr. Dob was the kind of the icon. So came from the Japanese very famous character Doraemon and Sonic the Hedgehog. Finally, looks like a you know Walt Disney the Mickey Mouse, <laughs> but right now it looks like my self portrait. So kind of change that is 20 years working together. <laughs> Sometimes he's playful and sweet, sometimes he's more menacing, sometimes he's being affected by all these external forces, or is even able to maybe create certain moods and ideas that reflect his own personal and artistic struggles and, and channel them into Mr. Dope. Everything came, came from the you know, Star Wars stuff. Lucas released for the making video. I was learning for the, oh my God, this is a process. Okay, director is making for the scenario, the storyboard, and then shooting a film and editing. This is a you know process. Uh, maybe like in a painting, it's much easier to lend it from the you know this system. One of the things that makes Murakami's work so unique is the scale. I mean, there are very few painters working today that can get anywhere close to the scale of the works that he's making. And then when you start looking even more closely at them, there's this incredible detail to them. A single person working in their studio would never be able to accomplish this unless they were just planning on making, you know, one or two paintings over a whole lifetime. I'm making for a small drawing and the scanning, and I gave for my assistant, assistant making for the computerization, and the blow up, and the burning, and the silk screen, and checking, and I don't like that. I'm again for the making for the drawing, I giving, like looks like a cycle. And then, you know, finished up the painting. Oh, this is great, because this painting is emptiness. So what is the greatest art piece is, I thought, emptiness.